Oh, good morning. How's it going? <laughs> uh, today we'll be reading from Mark 4, uh, 35 to 41, if you want to find that in your Bibles. I'm excited for today's sermon, but it's not one that I'm really excited for, because it's like, you have to admit that you're afraid sometimes, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> glad we got Jesus. Uh, verse 35 says this, And in the same day when the evening was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him, even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and said unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Pastor. All right, you can be seated. Um, we're going to do something slightly unusual here this morning, too. I, uh, uh, Sister Tammy is going to come here in just a moment. And uh, I asked her if she'd sing a song for us today. And... Um, I said, you know, like, what do you have kind of like, you know, in the can? What do you have ready to go? And she said, uh, what about his eyes on the sparrow? And, uh, and I don't know, I don't know if you picked up on my reaction immediately, but um, the Lord's really been dealing with my heart. Like th this one, why are you so afraid? This sermon for today was not actually in my original list of questions Jesus asked that I intended to preach on. But as I started to work uh, in the preparation for this week, the Lord spoke to my heart and said, you need to you need to talk about this being afraid thing. And so this sermon was really for me. I, 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 maybe I should have just done it as a Bible study and not tried to preach it. I don't know. Um, but then when Tammy said that, I was like, oh, that's exactly the thing. So I'm just excited uh, for this. And so before I preach, I asked Tammy, she would just come and sing his eyes on the sparrow for us. I feel discouraged Why must the shadows come Why does my heart feel lonely and long Closer to me, 
open the altar up and you can all come forward now. <laughs> all right. All right. Thank, thank you, sister. Praise the Lord. All right. Um, well, believe it or not, I'm going to try to preach. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, 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 you pray for me. We'll pray together in a moment. Um, <laughs> so as I, as I mentioned, we're getting back to our series, Questions Jesus Asked. It's been, it's been a minute. We started this series and then, uh, we had Missions Week and Communion and Easter, and, and now we're going to return to, to our series. This is the fourth a message in this, and the title of it is, Why Are You So Afraid? As I mentioned, this was not on my, I, have, I, have a, I made a list when I was, uh, so this was last fall as I was praying about what the next series was going to be and sermon series in church was going to be, and I started to make a list and do some of the initial kind of Bible study and work to, to prepare the series. And so I have a list at home of some of the questions that I want to tackle and that I feel like the Lord's leading towards. And this one was not on the list and until as we kind of moved along with some of the cancer stuff, uh, the Lord just really spoke to my heart about that I, I needed to do this study. And, and so I began to do that and put it together. And, and even just the timing of it for this week with just sort of the ups and downs that we've experienced this week, um, it's remarkable to me how quickly I can forget and how much I, I need the reminders. And so I, I, I've been grateful the Lord has used this, uh, this study in my life already pretty powerfully this week. And I expect him to continue to do that. And so I've been praying for all of you. Um, many of you um, are here this morning. You're facing something that's fearful. You're, you're, you're in the middle of it or it's coming down the tracks right now. And, and there's something that's, that's uh, sparking some anxiety. Some, some, there's a sharp bit of worry or, or fear that's in your hearts. Some, some of you, uh, maybe not right now, maybe right now there's, it's smooth sailing at the moment, but, but you know that storms come up suddenly. Somebody say amen. amen. And so, so my, my earnest prayer for this message has been that it might be helpful uh, to those of you that are in the middle of storms right now, and that it might be useful, that it might be some groundwork that the Lord would lay in your heart so that the next time a storm does come, that you've got some tools to, to tackle that with. And so I hope this will be helpful today. Uh, towards that end. Uh, you've already stood for the reading of the scripture, so I want to ask you to stand again. But if you've got your Bibles open to the Gospel of Mark chapter 4, let's look at these verses here again together, and then I'll pray. Uh, the Gospel of Mark chapter 4, and then we're just going to look at uh, verses 35 through 41 here, just at the end of the chapter. So Mark chapter 4, verse 35, it says, the same day that when the even was come, he said to them, let us pass over to the other side. And Jesus did much of his ministry um, along the Sea of Galilee, kind of up and down uh, the regions there. And, and so they would take boats to go back and forth. It's not a huge body of water. It's, you know, it's a decent size. You can't necessarily see all the way across it unless you get some elevation. And, and so, so Jesus uh, has been teaching in a boat the crowds at this point in his ministry, it's only chapter four, the gospel of Mark, but the gospel of Mark moves very quickly. It does not start with the uh, nativity scene at all. It just begins immediately with Jesus healing people and throwing demons out. And just Mark is like getting straight into it right away. And so by the time we get to chapter four, lots of ministry has been done. Jesus's fame has spread quite widely. There are very large crowds that are coming out into the wilderness places uh, to hear him preach and to see him teach and perform miracles. And the crowds at this point are so large that Jesus cannot speak effectively to all of them. Of course, they don't have microphones or speakers or anything like that. And so they have a very cool trick that the ancient peoples used to use. He went out onto a boat and the crowd would sort of gather on the, on the lake side, on the bank. 
And, and the, the sea provides sort of a natural soundboard, especially when you're preaching to people that are on a hillside. And so it kind of has a natural amplification effect so you could speak to a much larger crowd of people. And so that's what's happening. If you read earlier on in uh, chapter four, if you just back up to the first couple of verses, you'll see that that's what Jesus is doing. So he's already in the boat. He's, he's used the boat, if you will, as his pulpit uh, for this entire day. And they've been ministering all day to an entire crowd of people Christ and the disciples have. And now the sun is beginning to set and Jesus says, uh, we need to leave and go to the other side of the lake. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And so he goes away. They send the multitude away. They say, go home. We're, we're, we're sailing across the lake now and across the sea. And Jesus gets into the ship and some other little ships, people that have boats, they don't want to leave Jesus. And so they get in the boats that they can. And this little convoy heads out a, across the sea. Verse 37 as they go there, arouse a great storm of wind. People that are familiar with this uh, region, Galilee, say that the area is famous for the suddenness with the storms can come. They come over the hillsides. So you kind of don't really get much warning. They just come over the hills and sweep down on the sea. And, and you can get pretty impressive storms very quickly um, in that area. And so that's exactly what's happened. This terrible storm of wind comes up. And the Bible says the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. This is not just a rough sea. It's literally overwhelming the boats. Verse 38, but Jesus was in the hinder part of the ship. He's in the back of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And I don't know about you, but sometimes it does feel that way, doesn't it? When we're in a, a terrible storm, and it's just like everything's going wrong and you're ready to drown. And where's Jesus? feels like maybe he's asleep somewhere. Now, in this case, Jesus actually was asleep. So they go and they wake him up and they say, Master, carest thou not that we perish? That's a hard way to wake up. They say, Jesus, don't you care that we're dying? And uh, I've said almost that exact phrase to Jesus on a few occasions in my life. Don't you care that don't you care? I'm drowning. Don't you care? But they wake Jesus up here in verse 39, and he arose, and he rebuked the wind, and he said unto the sea, peace, be still. Some of you with kids know how hard it can be to get much of a response from children. If you say to rambunctious children, you say, peace, be still. But Jesus says this to the storm. And the Bible says immediately the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. There had been a great storm. But now there is a great calm. And then Jesus turns to the disciples in the boat with him. And he has two questions for them. And this series is on the questions that Jesus asked. And we're going to dive into it in a moment. But look at the questions with me first. Jesus asked them two questions. Number one, he said, why are you so fearful? And two, how is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly. And they said to one another, what manner of man is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. All right, let's pray together. Father, we thank you, God, for today, for this portion of scripture Lord, I want to just say thank you for the way that you've already used this in my heart and my life this week. But Lord, I don't believe that you're done yet. And uh, I, don't, I don't really feel like I'm the right person to preach this message. Um, but, but I think that you want it preached. And so, God, I just, I really need your help always. I feel that very sharply this morning. Please, God, would you help me? These are your people. And they've come to hear from you. So Lord, as we preach your word and we talk about it, God, I pray that you might, uh, through your word and by your spirit, you might speak clearly and just directly into every heart. There's so many storms around us and people here in this room, they're in the middle of terrible storms right now. So Lord, we just pray for a word of peace from you into every heart. And God, we just ask for these things in Jesus' name. Uh, amen. All right. 
All right, so in our series so far, we've covered what does the law say? Jesus asked the question, what does the law say? Of course, he knows what it says. He wrote it. He said, what are you seeking? What seek ye? What are you after in your life? What are you trying to get with your life? He asked, who do men say that I am? And then who do you say that I am? Today we have the question, why are you so afraid? I'd like to just do a little bit of review. It's in your bolts. And if you want to follow along and fill in the blanks here and some of the cross references as we go along, I'd invite you to do that as we jump around a little bit in some of the scriptures, make it easy. Of course, you're invited just to just listen. If you're watching the live stream this morning, we send out an email every Saturday that the bulletin is attached to. If you want to get those notes, you can follow along from home. Just let us know. But the background here very quickly is just that God already knows everything. I don't think I need to belabor that point. I did in the first sermon because <laughs> I love belaboring things. Um, but, but, you know, the Bible is emphatically clear on this. God knows everything. And you're here in a church on Sunday morning, so you probably believe that. It's true. God, God already knows everything, which makes the questions very weird. The fact that God had ever asked a question is a very weird thing. Because why would a God who knows everything ever ask a question? And so it leads us to the next thought, which is this, that God doesn't ask questions to get information. Uh, oftentimes when we ask a question, it's so that we can get information, but God is never, never doing that. Uh, sometimes we do ask questions for other reasons. Like I'll ask a question to Hugo, uh, my son. Sometimes I'll say, hey, bud, did you clean your room? I already know the answer to that question. Uh, my, my question is not to find out if he did or did not clean his room. I, 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 I walked by there. Um, I, I know. Um, my question is, a, it's, a, it's a reminder disguised as a question. And, and, and you all done that. And sometimes you get the insincere questions from people or the mocking questions from people. And there's lots of different ways to use a question, but we can be sure that God is not using a question to get information. But when God asks a question, he's not making fun of us. When God asks a question, it's always 100% of the time for our benefit. You can be certain that if God's asking you a question, that he's trying to help you with something. And God has very often in my life asked me very sharp questions. And I, I have never heard the audible voice of God. That, uh, not that God cannot do that, um, but, but that, that is a, mostly when God wants to speak. You all know how he speaks, amen? Yep. He speaks to us through his word. That's, that's it, right? But, but having said that, it is a regular occurrence for me that, there will be, that a sharp question will come into my heart that I know is not something that I, I thought of. Mostly because I'm against it. <laughs> I'm, I'm against this. The, the, the question will be like, do you really think a Christian should behave like that? <laughs> Is that, are you sure that's the way you want to treat your wife? <laughs> and those, those questions, I believe, are, that, that's the Holy Spirit at work. That's, that's God prompting a question. And and this sermon, in fact, came out of exactly one of those where just, just in my heart, just in my spirit, God asked me why I was so afraid. And uh, that question that God was asking me is, is for my benefit. And here in the text, we see that it's, we'll, we'll see this in a moment, it's for the disciples' benefit. And this morning, if God has a question for you, I would just like you to know that it's to help you. God always speaks from a position of omniscience. That's our $10 word for this sermon series is omniscience. You can use it to win Scrabble. It means, it means all knowing. Uh, omni for the all and the omniscience to know the science. And so the omniscience of Jesus, we just remark upon this regularly that there are many things that tell us that Jesus was not just a man. His miracles, his teaching, rising from the dead. There's, there's much about Jesus that tells us he was not merely a human being. Uh, but the omniscience of Jesus is one of the great signs of his divinity, that Jesus always knows 100% of everything that's going on. It's one of the great signs that he was not just merely a man. And that's important to bear in mind. All right. So as we get to our text this morning, and we want to break the verse apart uh, piece by piece. We're going to go through it line by line here together, and then we'll make some application here for the end of the message. But I'd like to start by just examining the text a little bit more closely. Here in verses 35 and 36, we, we see here um, the weakness and the priorities. So we work our way through these first two verses, 35 and 36, a weariness and priorities. Jesus has already been teaching all day long. 
Jesus has been preaching. I, may, I, may I say to you, if you don't know this, this is tiring work. <laughs> By the time church is over, I'm a worn out person. And, and I do this for, you know, four or five hours on a Sunday morning. And I'm, I'm whooped. Um, and, and I look forward to my nap when I get home from church. <laughs> Sunday afternoon naps are a blessed thing. Um, but, but Jesus here has been doing this all day long, and he's been doing it day after day after day after day. Sometimes just reading Jesus' schedule, just reading his schedule makes me tired. Verse 1 says, Jesus began to teach again by the seaside. There was gathered unto him a great multitude, so he entered a ship. He sat in the sea, and the whole multitude on the sea and the land. And then here in verse 35, the same day when he was come, the evening was come, he said, let's go to the other side. So he sent the multitude away, and they they took him even as he was in the ship. He's already in the boat. And so they just psh, sailed away. And there was with him other little ships. Sometimes we ask the question, why would Jesus leave such a large crowd eager for teaching? It's all here. People have come to hear Jesus teach. Jesus is here to preach the gospel. He's, he's here to set the captives free and give sight to the blind and bind up the brokenhearted. And here they are, the blind and the brokenhearted and the captive. Why is he leaving them? There's a need on the other side of the sea. We talk about this usually every January when we talk about the need for priorities that Jesus, even in his physical body, one of the things about the incarnation, when Jesus left his throne in heaven and came here, he limited himself to a human body. He, he became a person. Now, he's still God. Somebody say amen. It's the, it's the mystery of the incarnation. But, but in, his, in his human body, Jesus needed to eat, and he needed to sleep, and he got tired. And he could only be in one place at a time. And the need is great. And Jesus has spent all day with these people, but there's a need on the other side of the sea. In fact, if you read in Mark 5, you'll see that there's a, a, a man possessed of evil spirits on the other side, and he's harming himself and scaring people, and he's a wild man. And Jesus is going to go to the other side of the sea, and he's going to heal this man. And he's going to send him to Decapolis. It's 10 Greek cities. Jesus' ministry was almost exclusively to the nation of Israel. But he's going to go over to the other side of the sea, deliver this captive man, and send him as an evangelist to 10 cities that Jesus is never physically going to set foot in. And so, uh, you, go read, you can read it in Mark chapter 5. It's an incredible story. And, but Jesus, here, as a, as a human, is experiencing weariness and the need for priorities. And if you're here this morning and you're a human also, <laughs> I'd suggest that you're not going to do better than Jesus either. We get tired and you're going to need to set some priorities. I'm struggling with that right now. God spoke to my heart in some ways I don't have time to preach on uh, right now, but as I try to take care of my family and my wife and through the hard things and the chemotherapy and the things that we're facing of trying to make sure that we're managing the weariness and the priorities in the way that God would have us to do. And I just say to you this morning, as you go through a storm, it's not, you're not failing. If I just say this quickly, I do not believe you're failing as a Christian to have to manage your weariness and priorities. So grateful for Brother Scott, and I know it was a hard loss for him to not be able to be here with the choir um, on Easter Sunday. Praise God. We said it's, you know, it's a good Sunday for a resurrection, and here he is back on his feet. Praise God. Praise uh, God. But I just, I called him, I, I, I know what that's like to want to do something, ministry, and not be able to do it. And, and so I called him after church on Easter, and I said, don't, don't beat yourself up. And he gave me one of those uh-huh kind of answers <laughs> that told me he was in the process of beating himself up about it. And so just to Brother Scott and to any of you that are facing that, and can I just say to you, it's not a failure to be a human being. You have to manage your weariness and your priorities. All right. So then in verse 37, we find that the terrible storm comes up. That's, that's why you don't want to get to know the pastor too well. You get name checked in a sermon. Um, <laughs> in verse 37, we find the terrible storm arises. Verse 37 says, there arose a great storm of wind and the wee waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. Just a couple of things quickly about this storm. If we look a little more closely at the Greek, we can get some sense of it. And first of all, of course, it just says that the storm was great. That it was a great storm. But sometimes we can lose the force of that in English. We overuse, I think maybe because of marketing, <laughs> we, everything's great and awesome and new and improved, which something cannot be both new and improved. But anyway, 
Sometimes we've diminished the, the value of some of these words. And I just want you to know that the word here in the Greek that's used in the original uh, for great here is megas. That's literally the Greek word. It's the, the storm was megas. It was a megas storm. And it means exactly what you would guess. It's large, intense, violent, mighty, loud, great. And storms, I, I've only been out in big storms once or twice in my life. And, and they're a humbling thing, especially if you're kind of out in a remote area. They're scary enough if you're in, in a house. But if you're out in a boat in the open sea, uh, the, the idea of being trapped in something that's as loud and as violent and as tumultuous as this is a, is a very scary prospect. Not only was the storm great, but secondly, the Bible notes for us that the waves were beating into the ship, that this is a, a relentless storm. It's some storms, they, they come up and they're very scary for a few moments and then it's over. I remember the first time I ever went to Georgia and, and there was like this incredible rainstorm that happened. It was just like uh, we'd taken a taxi from the airport and, and this, and all of a sudden it just started raining, just like like it was like God was going to wipe us all out again. It was just whoosh, like somebody turned a faucet on. It was just incredible. And it lasted about 10 minutes and it was over. It was just the weirdest experience. Uh, but this is not that kind of a storm. This is a relentless storm. The word here that the waves beat into the ship in the Greek, it's the epiballo, and it means to seize, to rush in, or to beat into. In fact, as I, as I looked at this word, it was interesting. This is the exact same word that's used when the guards came and seized Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. In each of the gospel accounts, when the guards rush in to take Christ, this is the word that's used. The epibalo. It's, it's, it's to rush in. It's taken a hold of the ship. This is a relentless storm, and it has seized the ship. And then thirdly, the Bible tells us that the boat couldn't take any more. It says the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. That was an interesting one too when I looked at it in the Greek. It's a, it's a repetition of words there that's translated so that it was now full. In the Greek, it's um, gemedzo ede gemedzo. So it, 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 re it repeats the gemedzo twice. Gemedzo ede gemedzo. That's, that's literally what's there in the text. And it means to fill entirely. It's basically saying it was filling it and filling it and filling it to the point where now it has been filled to the point it cannot be filled anymore. And I just feel like this storm, this is a real literal storm, of course, but what a great picture of so many of the storms that come into our lives. You, you'd be hard-pressed to find a, a better metaphor. Sometimes the storms that we face are, they're so large, they're so intense, they're so violent, they're so loud. Maybe not loud in the way that a thunder and windstorm is loud, but it makes it hard to think. They're relentless. Some of these trials that we face, now, now some difficulties, you, you get popped and it's over. And those are no fun. But every so often in life, we face these storms where it's just one thing after another. And it's just like watching a train go by where it's just, and the next thing, and the next thing. And you say, how long is this train? How much more of this can I take? I do not know how much more of this I can bear. And some of you, like me, have been to the point where you've said, the ship's full now. If there's one more wave, I'm going to sink. And that's the situation that the disciples are physically in this situation that I believe is very good picture of what many of you are facing even now. And when we're in that position, the question is very natural. Does Jesus care about it? We noted there in verse 38, you can read it again, that Jesus was in the hinder part of the ship and he was asleep on a pillow. So they woke him up and they said unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Jesus, don't you care? Before we get too mad at the disciples for this, I mean, I'll just tell you that at points in my life as the trials have unfolded that I've not even bothered to go to Jesus and say, don't you care? 
I've just been pretty sure that he doesn't. I just, without even, without even saying to Jesus something rude, I just, I just wrote him off without ever giving him a chance. Because I just think if Jesus cared, he would have already done something. I think things like, I wouldn't do this to my daughter. I think things like, I wouldn't put Hugo through this. I think things like, as a pastor, if I could stop some of the things that some of you are going through, I would stop it right away. If I had the ability to fix some of the things that some of you are facing, I would fix it. I would stay here all day with my magic wand, just boop, boop, boop. And so it's very hard to understand why God does not do that for me. And it's hard to understand why he doesn't do it for you. And so the question, I think, is a very obvious one. Jesus, do you care? In verse 39, we see the astonishing power of Christ. And this doesn't really answer the question, does Jesus care? We're coming back to that because part of the reason we wonder if he cares is because we believe he has the power to do something. If we didn't think he had the power, then we'd just be like, that's why none of you, you, you maybe you don't accuse me of, pastor, do you care? Because you know I can't help you. <laughs> and so you're not bothered about whether I care or not because you know there's nothing I can do. But with Jesus, he's like, well, there's something he could do. But, but it is important to make note here of the power of Christ. Verse 39, he stood and he rebuked the wind. He said unto the sea, peace, be still. And, and, and just almost the, just the familiarity with which Jesus speaks to the very forces of nature is an astonishing thing all by itself. There's no elaborate prayer. There's no ritual. Jesus doesn't have to like gather his thoughts together. It's like, it's like any of us would be if a kid woke us up in the middle of a sleep we might, we might say, shush, go to bed. And Jesus, they, they wake him up, and there's a huge storm. He says, shush. And so the storm stops. It's an, it's an amazing thing that Jesus doesn't, and, and it's not like the storm kind of like wheezes out over time. Jesus gets up and he goes, knock it off. And the storm just, Okay. And the wind ceased, and there's a great calm. One of the things I, I love about this story, this is just really just a side note, but this is one of my favorite, actually, examples in, in story form of the humanity and the deity of Christ. It's one of, it's one of the great mysteries of the Christian faith that ri lies right at the heart of what we believe as Christians, that Jesus Christ was fully God and fully man. That's a, that's a very difficult thing to understand, but it's it's a central Christian teaching. If you don't believe that, you're not a Christian. That's, it's a core part of our faith. And, but, I, but I like this story of Jesus asleep in the sea in the storm because it's a great picture in, in capsule form of the humanity and the deity of Christ. We, we see his humanity very clearly. He's, he's one person. He's in his boat. He's tired. He needs to sleep. He's had such a long series of days. He's sleeping through a terrible storm. I remember in college one time I slept through my roommate vacuuming our room. I mean, you know, that's like uh, because I was studying so hard. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, when you're really wiped out, you can sleep through a thing or two, you know. And Jesus here, you know, he's, he's, he's tired. And so we see his humanity here as he is asleep through the storm. But then we also see his deity because he wakes up and he says to the storm, okay, that's enough. And the storm stops. So who is this man? One of the things I love about this is it reminds me that Jesus understands us. So why would God do this? Why would God become a person? It's because when you and I are in a storm, when you and I are going through these things, there's such tenderness to know that Jesus gets it. That he's familiar with what it's like to be tired. 
When you're weary and you feel like, God, I would like to do better, but I'm just, I'm so tired, I'm stretched so thin, I'm so worn down. Do you know how wonderful it is that God knows what that's like? He understands it, not just because he's God and he knows everything, but he has the actual personal experience with what exactly that is like. I think that's a really cool thing. Hebrews encourages us that because Jesus Christ is our great high priest, that we ought to come boldly to the throne of grace. When you need something, you come talk to Jesus about it. He understands you. It's a good thing. And then finally in verse, or almost finally, not quite, Jesus has his two questions, and these questions focus on fear and faith. Jesus said unto them, why are you so fearful? And how is it that you have no faith? It's interesting, these two questions, we're coming back to this in just a moment, but the first question is a why question. It's a why question. Why are you so fearful? Why questions are invitations to think. And they're asking about motivation. And then the second question is a how question. He says, how is it that you have no faith. And those are two different words in the Greek. It's there in the original. It's Jesus asks his why question and his how question. The why question is why so fearful. And the how question is how did you get to this point? How is a mechanics question? It's a, it's a process question. What were the series of events that got you from A to B? How did you arrive at this point? And we're going to look at those more closely in just a moment. And then verse 41, they end up fearing God more than the storm. They were fearful that they were about to die. The ship is going down and Jesus doesn't care. So they wake him up. They say, don't you care? And Jesus turns the storm off, asks him his questions. But I want you to note there in verse 41 that they're not done being afraid. That they've been afraid of the storm. And now they're afraid of Jesus. <laughs> yeah, 100% I would be. If, if some guy just got up and said, shush, and the storm stopped, like, now you've got my attention. They said, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, I, I want you to know that sometimes, you know, when we think about what does it mean to be afraid of God, um, the example I like to use, I think to best understand it is to think about fear like a fire. In fact, the Bible in the book of Hebrews chapter 12 does compare God to that. It says, wherefore, we receive a kingdom that cannot be moved. Let us have grace where we serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire, the Bible says. We are uh, very eager to teach Hugo about fire. When he was little, we had a, at, at that time, we had a pellet stove. And, you know, if you burn pellets and it got very, very hot. And so we did not want him to walk, crawl over there and put his little two-year-old hand on the fire. So we put the fear of fire in him. I think we did too good of a job. He didn't eat spicy food for like five years after that. Because we made the mistake saying, oh, it's kind of hot. And then he was like, no hot. I learned that lesson. And so anyway, but fear of fire, because here's the thing about fire. Fire's not, it's not like fire's good or bad or anything like that. Fire is what it is. Amen. Amen. And if you respect fire, it'll cook your food. It'll heat your house, power your car. You can make s'mores with it. Right? But if you don't respect fire, it'll burn your hand, it'll burn your house to the ground, and you can die, right? And fire doesn't care if you're real handsome, right? Fire doesn't play favorites. Fire is what it is. And I'll just remind you that, that God, the eternal, holy creator God, is who he is. And it is... It is not something we should be disrespectful towards. It is not something that if you abuse fire, you're going to suffer. And we ought to have a little bit of fear, a little bit of holy fear when we think about the living, holy, holy, holy God. Which is why the incarnation is so wonderful. Because I don't know about you, but I would be way too scared... <laughs> To go try to talk to an infinite, perfectly holy being who knows all about me. 
unless I'd been reassured that he understands and that he cares. And that's where Jesus comes in because God is way too scary unless he comes towards us. And so he's come towards us in the person of Christ so that we can be saved, so that we can be remade, we can be adopted. And so God is not just this scary thing anymore, but we can come to God and call him Father. We can approach him as his children. But it starts with having some respect for God. And the disciples are learning that right here. Okay. Let's use the end of our time here together to look at these questions more closely. And I believe that God has some things to say to us here as we consider why these questions. And his first one is, why so fearful? <laughs> How many of you, when you first read that, thought, that seems like a stupid question? <laughs> We just read about the mega storm relentlessly beating into the ship, seizing a hold upon it. It's already filled it full. It's not like the disciples panicked at a breeze. It's not like they're like, oh no, it looks like rain. Like that's not what's going on here. They are about to drown. The ship is all the way full. There's not room for another drop of water. And Jesus is sleeping through the whole thing. What do you mean? Why are you afraid? That's a ridiculous question, it seems. But again, Jesus is not looking for information. That's not really what we're after here. I'd like to say this, first of all, as clearly as I can this morning. I want to say something about the reality of fear. About the reality of fear. I don't think it was intentional, but sometimes growing up in church, um, I got the idea that if you were afraid of something, it meant that you were like broken as a Christian. That, that like as Christians, we should not be afraid. And that if, if you felt fear, then you were not walking with God the way that you should be walking with God. And that was, I, I don't know if the pastors intended that. Um, I, I think they probably didn't. But that was kind of what I heard. That was what I took on board. And so because of that, and, and then given the things that have happened in my life since then, it's important to me to try to be clear with you as your pastor to say this to you. Many of your fears are perfectly reasonable and perfectly rational. I think there are things that happen in your life and in mine that if they don't make you afraid, you're probably a sociopath. I mean, 2% of the population is. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Obviously, they're scared. Who wouldn't be scared? I don't think being scared means you're not a good Christian. I don't think that's what the Bible teaches. I don't think that's the way Jesus looked at it. And we're going to see that here. And sometimes we can read this question from Jesus. Why are you so afraid? Like it's, like it's an accusation. And sometimes and I think that's kind of how I took it. Like Jesus is like, why are you so afraid? You know, that's not how Jesus sounds. That's not how Jesus sounds. He's not beating up on the disciples for being afraid. It would be super weird if they weren't. This is a big, scary storm, and they are about to drown. And Jesus is sleeping through it. It is reasonable for them to be afraid. It is rational behavior. We see this all in the Bible. Exodus 14, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes. Behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. No, duh. They just escaped 300 years of slavery, and here come the people with all the weapons to come get them, and they're trapped against the Red Sea. Here comes the army. What's their reaction? Fear. Psalm 31, David says, I have heard the slander of many. Fear is on every side. They took counsel together against me. They devised to take away my life. He says, my enemies are out there plotting to kill me. Obviously, he's afraid. Job. I don't like to preach on Job. I'm glad we got Pastor Farouk to do that. <laughs> but Job, Job says this, and this, this, this hits home for me. I'm sure it will for many of you too. Job said, my sighing comes before I eat. My roarings are poured out like waters. The thing which I greatly feared is come upon me. 
And that which I was afraid of is come unto me. So that thing I was most worried about happened. Sometimes we, you, people get criticized, maybe you've been criticized for, well, you shouldn't worry about that thing. You know, it, may, it might not happen. And fair enough. Well, that's borrowed trouble. And, and, and really, that's, that's, as far as it goes, that's good advice. You know, you shouldn't worry about that stuff. But how many of you know, like I know, that sometimes those things you worry about absolutely do happen. It, didn't mean, it doesn't mean that you're crazy. You're not, you're not a lunatic for being like, that looks bad. They found a lump. It looks bad. Your daughter's heart's not the right shape. It looks bad. The marriage is falling apart. Doesn't look good. The kids tangled up with the wrong crowd and it's going the wrong way. Cancer's back and it doesn't look good. Many of our fears are perfectly reasonable, perfectly rational. Jesus is not criticizing them for being afraid. The storms that we face, they can be terrible. They can be relentless. And they can quickly go beyond our ability to bear them. That's not nothing you did. Sometimes people get the idea that they did something to deserve the storm. <laughs> and I, now you can get yourself into trouble. Somebody say amen. <laughs> you can for sure do that. But my experience is most of the big storms don't come from stuff that people did. They just come. Because storms come. And sometimes they're so big and so terrible and so relentless that you just can't take it anymore. So why is Jesus asking this question? I'd like to suggest to you this morning that it can be very helpful that this question is for our benefit because it can be very helpful to start thinking again. Fear wipes out our brains. I know you don't want to say amen to that, but how many of you, just to encourage somebody else here and, and your pastor, that it's not just me, that sometimes when you get really afraid of something, your brain just kind of like, Bruh. yeah? Okay, that makes me feel a little better. Thank you. Sometimes these things, because these they, they are scary. And sometimes they're so scary, or you've been worried about it for so long, and then now it happens, and it's like, it's like that fear has just been built up like behind a dam, and now it's released, and it all just comes out, and your brain's just into mush. And so Jesus is asking this question not to give information and not to accuse them and not to make them feel bad. He's trying to re-engage their brains on what's happening here. This is for the benefit of the disciples. And when Jesus asks you this question, I believe when Jesus asks me this question, he's inviting me to begin thinking again about my situation and not just be paralyzed with fear. Because fear will paralyze you. It can be helpful to name our fears so that we can begin to examine it. What are you afraid of? I'm afraid the boat's going to sink. I'm afraid that I'm going to drown. I'm afraid that Jesus doesn't care about my life. It's a starting point to name what you're afraid of. If you're here this morning and you're dealing with something that is so fearful and so overwhelming, and if over the course of this sermon or today, if you feel Jesus asking you, hey, why are you so afraid? I'd encourage you to start by not just feeling bad or feeling like, oh, I shouldn't be afraid. You probably should be afraid. When that question comes, it's an invitation to actually answer the question. Why? What specifically is it that you're afraid of? It's a good starting point. 
Because first of all, it's going to help you just drag it out of this nameless, formless, terrifying thing into a concrete, this is what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid that I'm going to have to bury my daughter. I'm, af I'm afraid of watching my wife suffer. I'm afraid of what that might do to my kids. And other things. Step one is to drag it out into the light. When Jesus is asking you this question, it's to help us so that we can name what it is and start to look at it. Jesus is inviting us to stop being paralyzed with fear and to begin to think about our experience so that he can help. Because as long as it stays, I'm just so afraid. It's very difficult for Jesus to do anything with that in your life. It's very hard for him to do anything with it in my heart. If I'm just walking around afraid and thinking Jesus doesn't care about me, then I'm just probably going to stay in that space. But if I can begin to engage with God on this, if I start to critically think about it and start to engage with Jesus on it, now God can start, he can ask me the second question. And we can start to get somewhere. And I believe that's why the first question is to get us to engage again with God, to get out of the fear paralysis, and to start to say, why am I afraid? Which leads us then to question two. How is it that you have no faith? Now, again, I do not believe Jesus is just beating up on these disciples. Sometimes we get this idea that he's just like, do better. <laughs> you know, that's, again, that's not how Jesus talks to us, is it? You go find somewhere in the Gospels where Jesus talked to anybody like that. The Pharisees a little bit. <laughs> If you're being a Pharisee, then you deserve what's coming. But I'm just saying, if you're hurting, if you're in the middle of the storm and worried about what's going on, Jesus is not coming at you with a stick. It's not how he does it. The sticks are the self-righteous know-it-alls who have their life all together. If you're a mess in a puddle, I got good news for you. Jesus leaves his stick at home. <laughs> but it's a good question. Of course it is. Jesus asked it. How'd you end up here? How'd you end up in this fearful, terrified place? Because what am I afraid of? I'm afraid of drowning. I'm afraid you don't care. So she said, how'd you end up there? How'd you get to a point where you think, I'm going to let you drown and I don't care about you? How? It's a mechanics question, remember? It's a process question. How, how did you get to this point where you think, I don't care about you and I'm going to let you drown and I'm going to like drown with you? I mean, like, let's think here. But now we're thinking. Now we're not just afraid because of the storm. Now we're thinking about it. What exactly do you think is going to happen? And how knowing me do you think I'm going to let this happen? Jesus so says, you know me. You know me. How'd you end up so afraid knowing me and knowing I'm in the boat? Do you really think I'm going to let you down? Do you really think I don't care about you? How did you forget that you know who I am? This leads us to our great need. Our great need is for a shield of faith. I preached on some of this last year in our series on being prepared. I'm going to cover this quickly. I already preached a whole sermon on the shield of faith. It's on the website. You can go back and get it if you want. But I would just say this, that our fears are real, and so we need a real faith. Ephesians 6 says, Above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. The shield there is the, the thorohas, it's, a, it's not just like a small shield. It's a large door-shaped shield. It's referring to the, to the Roman scutum. Um, this is not a real picture of it. It is a recreation, obviously. <laughs> but, I mean, the, the shield was, it was, a, it was designed to cover the entire soldier. When the Bible says, above all, take the shield of faith, that above all means out in front or covering. The idea is that our faith is to be out in front and covering everything. It's a, it's a very specific kind of shield. And the shield that we need, we need something out in front of us. We need something to keep us safe. We need something to hide behind in the storms, and that shield is faith. 
And the, the word most commonly translated as faith in our, in our Bible is pestis, and it means faith. It means assurance or belief. It is a conviction that something is true. It's trust. When the Bible says take the shield of faith, it means take up the conviction that something's true. It's like, and a conviction that something's true is not, when, some, when things are wobbly, you think, well, I believe that this is true. You're trusting something. We define faith this way, that faith is a reasoned confidence in the trustworthiness and in the power of God. Faith is not, I don't, I don't believe in blind faith, and, and God does not invite us into blind faith. The biblical faith, the faith that honors God, the faith that God is looking for from you and me, is not just a check your brains at the door and just believe me because I said so kind of faith. The faith that God is looking for from us is the kind of faith that is a reasoned confidence that God is both trustworthy and powerful. If you say, I have enough evidence to believe that God is trustworthy and I have enough evidence to believe that God is powerful, then it is reasonable to have confidence in God. And that reasonable confidence in God is faith. That's what the Bible's talking about when it says faith. Faith, in another way to put it, is trust in a person who is worthy of that trust. How many of you put your faith in somebody that turned out to be disappointing? Yeah, right? We trusted the wrong person. Faith is only as good as what you put it in. You put your faith in the wrong thing, you're going to get burned. But you'll never get burned by putting your faith in God. Amen. He is trustworthy. He is powerful. You can trust him. It is reasonable to have faith in God. That does not mean everything's going to go well. Look at Jesus' life. Look at the life of his disciples. But that doesn't mean God's not worth trusting. Jesus is asking them how they lost their faith. Because this is, again, a matter of reasoning. Faith is a reasoned confidence. So, when Jesus says to his disciples, how did you lose your faith? He's like, you had faith. You'd reasoned your way into this. What happened to talk you back out of it? This is a good question for us. We say, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I believe he was born of the Virgin Mary, and I believe he lived a sinless life. He died on an old rugged cross for my sins. He defeats sin, death, and hell. He rose from the grave on the third day. Praise God, I believe. I believe that he invites whosoever will to come and be saved. I hope you believe that. I do. I believe that's all 100% real. <laughs> so if we have this confidence in God, then when I end up in a place where I'm so terrified that Jesus doesn't care about me, that it's hard to think anymore, Jesus is inviting us to say, how did you get there? From empty tomb to so afraid you can't think. What happened? God is asking us to trust him based on the evidence of all that he's done. Even when God gives the Ten Commandments, before God just starts handing out the Ten Commandments even, he starts out in Exodus 22 with, I'm the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. He says, remember, I'm the one who rescued you. I delivered you from slavery. I brought you across the Red Sea. Now here are the rules. <laughs> right? It's, it, it's he gives them the evidence for why they ought to believe what he's saying. And when he, God comes to us, he says, look at what I've done. Now here's what I want you to do. God asks us to trust him based on the knowledge of who he is. The better I get to know Jesus, the easier he is to trust. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. As we hear more about God, as we know more about him from his word, we can have more faith. Because faith is trusting a person that we know, and that we believe is worthy of that trust. So I don't like, you see pretty pictures all over. You know, you go to Hobby Lobby, you'll find basically this poster. It says, faith is basically wishful thinking. <laughs> People have this idea. That's not really true, but you know, that's how they strike me. I read some of these things, these cutesy things that you see about faith that somebody put on Instagram or, or wherever like that. And it's just some cute thing about, if you just really believe it, it'll be true. And like, yeah. <laughs> And people get the wrong idea about what faith is. They kind of think that faith is just like hoping, you know, or, or wishing for something. I got the biggest no sign I could find. 
Faith is not wishful thinking. Faith is trusting the promises of a God who loves you and cannot lie. That's what faith is. Faith is saying, I believe God loves me enough to die on an old rugged cross for me, and I believe that he tells the truth. So if God gave me a promise, I believe it's true. End of story. And we just need to be reminded of that. Now, I wish there was a promise in the Bible that said, everything's going to go well, your life's going to be super easy, nobody loves ever going to get sick. I promise. Wouldn't that be awesome? That'd be super cool. I read my Bible cover to cover a few times. That promise is not in there. The opposite's in there. Jesus said, in the world, you shall have tribulation. But then he said, but be a good cheer. I've overcome the world. Both parts of those are true. Because Jesus tells the truth. World's, world's bumpy. World's bumpy. But Jesus beat it. I know that it's about time for me to be wrapping this up. I want to spend the last few moments that we have together talking about the how of growing a faith that's bigger than your storm. This is a how question that Jesus has asked. How did you get here? There's a process that led them from watching Jesus heal the sick and give sight to the blind and feed 5,000 people to so afraid they're going to drown and that Jesus doesn't care. There's a process. And I, you know, this storm was a, it was, it was a beating on the boat. It was a continual filling. Maybe they started out with fine faith, but as it kept going on, sometimes it's not even that the thing itself is even necessarily that bad. It's just the persistence of it. It's the relentless nature of it that can wear us down. And I don't know what it is in your life. Maybe it's, it's because it's the thing that you were so afraid of and now it's happened. Maybe it's because it's the thing that you thought, I, I can suffer the loss of everything, but not that. And now that's the thing that's threatened. I don't know what it is. The, the process, we don't know in the heart of each disciple exactly what it was. I don't know what it is in your heart. I know a little bit about what it is in my heart. But there's a process that gets us from faith into fear. And so I want to end the message this morning by talking a little bit about how do we start to reverse that? And I'm not the best person to preach this because I'm, I'm very much in this process right now myself. So I, I feel a little bit like a hypocrite on some of this because I'm not doing this very well. But I'm trying. And I believe it's true that I'm going to show you from the Bible what I think the Bible process is. And I just, I feel like less of a hypocrite if I admit that um, I'm struggling with this, but I'm trying. And I want to tell you what the Bible says about it. <clears throat> but it starts with being honest. Why? I want to encourage you to name your fears. What is that thing that's paralyzing you? Drag it out into the light so you can start to talk to Jesus about it. And then the how question. How did I get here? How, how, how is it that the fear became so loud? Because when you start to understand how you got there, then it's going to help with how do we start to unwind this now? So we're going to end by talking about the how. And I believe the best instruction for it comes out of Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11, it's the chapter about the heroes of our faith. And it just lists through hero after hero from the Old Testament. But it concludes about this. It says, these all died in faith. They all died in faith. They're all, they kept their faith all the way to the end. That's why they're our heroes. Not having received the promises. In many of the cases, they didn't even actually receive the promise. They were trusting God to keep a promise that in their lifetime, they never even saw come true. But they saw them, Hebrews 11 says, but they saw them afar off. And they were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. That this world was not their home, that they were just passing through. And so the fact that it looks bad now did not destroy their faith in God because they're, they're just here temporarily anyway. So here, here, here's the steps I believe that will help us. How do we build the kind of faith that's actually bigger than the storm we're going through? Some of you are facing very big storms. I'm in the middle of a pretty big storm right now. And I found myself being so afraid I cannot think. And I'm grateful that Jesus has invited me to talk to him about it. What specifically are you afraid of? 
And, and, and Josh, you've been through, this is not the first storm in my life. I've been with Jesus for quite a while now. I've seen him do wonderful things. How did I forget who he was? How did I forget what Jesus is like so badly that I could be this afraid? And so I'm looking at my reasons for how I got that afraid. And it's been instructive for me to see in my own life the steps that I went down that allowed the fear to get that big. So as we try to unwind it, it's persuasion, embracing, and confession. Let's take them one at a time. Persuade. Our heroes of the faith were persuaded of the things they believed about God. We need to remind ourselves of the truth. Remind yourself about the things that are true. I know you know them. Me too. We need to be reminded. I mean, I went over the course of less than 48 hours from like, this is a hug from Jesus. Look at this really cool thing that Jesus just arranged that I could have never planned. I could have never arranged it. It's so clearly God. Look at how he's taking care of me. Look at how he's taking care of Heather to why hast thou forsaken me in less than 48 hours, right? This is like, how did I manage that? And then I was putting the PowerPoint out of the sermon was done on Tuesday, but on Saturday, and then I was putting together the, these slides that you're looking at now. And I was like, Oh no. <laughs> I wrote this on Tuesday and forgot by Saturday. And I hope some of you are going to get something out of this sermon, but I, I just thought that I was really glad that God kind of gave this sermon for me to write so that I could have it as a reminder on Saturday because I needed it. It is reasonable. It is reasonable to trust God to keep his promises. God did not promise that things are going to go well. There are no promises that my kid is going to be okay. There are no promises that Heather is going to be able to tolerate the chemo. There are no promises about how long we get to have together. There are no promises about that here. There is a promise of a great reunion. There is a promise of a land that's fairer than day. By faith, we can see it afar. And Jesus waits there. The first full conversation that I will ever get to have with Evangeline is going to be on streets of gold. And so I'm scared about all that she goes through, but I'm looking forward to that day. And sometimes when you're really scared, you need to remind yourself of the truth and remember that it's reasonable to trust God to keep his promises. Abraham did. God said, I'm going to give you so many descendants that you won't be able to count them. <laughs> and Abraham had no kids and was pushing 80. <laughs> but he believed God, even though that seems crazy. And guess what? God keeps his promises. Secondly, we need to embrace. You've got to prioritize a growing relationship with Jesus. Your faith is not just something you've chosen to do. Biblical faith is trusting a person that you know. The more you know Jesus, the more you can trust him. If we know Jesus a little, we can only trust him a little. If we know Jesus medium, we can trust him medium. I want to know Jesus really well so that I can trust him really fully. And you would think, oh, the pastor, obviously he knows Jesus. <laughs> and I do. I mean, I know Jesus. I do. But I don't know what Jesus is like yet, when your wife has cancer, I'm learning right now what Jesus is like in that situation. 
And as I get to know him better, I believe I'm going to be able to trust him more in this situation because I'm going to know firsthand how he is. Some things about how Jesus is, you just only learn them in the fire. And then you see that he was there with you even then. And now you know something about Jesus in a way that you didn't know before you did it. We need to prioritize that relationship with Jesus. I, me, I used to, when I, when I was really having a hard time, I used to quit reading my Bible and I used to quit praying. <laughs> and so that's you, that's super normal. Um, but the Lord finally grew me past that. But now what I do is much more spiritual. <laughs> I still read and I pray, but I do it real mechanically. <laughs> I do it like I'm supposed to. You know, like, I read my Bible, check. Much more spiritual. <laughs> so what the Lord's speaking to me about is that what I need to do is I need to prioritize an actual growing relationship with him. It's not just checking the boxes. It's actually hanging in there with the Lord. That's hard when you're scared, but that's how you grow a faith that's bigger than your storm. And then finally, it's confession. <clears throat> oh, yeah. The more we personally know about God, the more our faith can grow. I just said that. And then confession is we need to take an eternal perspective in trials. You've just heard me do it a little bit already. It's important that I think say out loud and, and, and to yourself that this world is not my home. That the things that happen here are not the whole story. You cannot look at just what's happening here and understand the whole picture. This is just a fraction of what's actually happening. We have to have a little bit of a bigger perspective than just that it hurts right now, than just that it's scary right now. There's more going on than just what hurts and what's scary. And I'd like to end the message by saying this to you. When you're afraid, remember that Jesus is in the boat with you. It might seem like he's sleeping. You might want to give Jesus a good old-fashioned shake and go. <laughs> but the boat's full now. Your pillow's floating. <laughs> but there's good news. He's there in the boat. How good is it that Jesus is there in the boat? The boat might be sinking, but Jesus walks on water. And if you sink, he can grab you. He will. There's a promise that we do have. He said, I will never leave thee or forsake thee. Jesus, Jesus is in the boat. I'm very scared about many things. But I believe that Jesus is in the boat with us. Amy Carmichael gave up her life to go take care of orphans in India. She wrote this poem. It says, Thou art the Lord who slept upon the pillow. Thou art the Lord who soothed the furious sea. What matter is the beating wind and tossing billow? If only we are in the boat with thee. Sister, if you're able to come and play, and I know it's pizza time, and I'm going to let you go in just a second. But before you do, could I, could I invite you just while the piano plays? I'm not, I'm not going to ask anyone to raise their hand. I'm not going to ask you to come forward or do anything like that. And Some people need to go and do the things, and that's fine. You, you go do the things you need to do. But, but if you're able, I, I'd invite you here before the service is done to just take a moment and talk to the Lord. Our theme for the year is being connected to power, being connected to the power of the Lord. And we can do that. We connect to power by listening to God. We connect to power by talking honestly with God. And we connect to power by partnering up with God in whatever it is he's doing. And that's our theme for the year. And I, I'd like to remind you here at the end of this sermon that God might, that God wants to connect with you. Maybe your boat's sinking. You need power. 
you need help. I think your fears are probably perfectly reasonable. And I don't think Jesus is mad at you for being afraid. I don't think he's disappointed. I think he became a person, a human being, so that we could be sure that when we talk to him, he gets it. He gets you. So that you can come to him filled with confidence that he wants to hear from you and that he wants to help you. Maybe Jesus is asking you some questions like he's asked me this week. What's Jesus saying to you this morning? Maybe he has a question for you. Why are you afraid? How'd you get here? Are you... Maybe you just needed a reminder this morning that Jesus is in the boat with you. <laughs> He'll listen for his voice. He's there. <laughs> Maybe there's some specific truth or promise you need to remember. I'm going to stop talking in just a minute. This is, your, this is your chance of quietness with you and God. What is it that God wants to say to you personally this morning? Maybe it's a question. Maybe it's a reminder. Whatever it is, would you listen to him? Maybe, the, maybe, it's, maybe you know what the questions are, but you need to take a second. You need to take a moment and just talk to him. Maybe it's been a minute since you were really honest when you talked to God. When was the last time you had an honest conversation, just you and God? Maybe Jesus is inviting you to go ahead and name those things that you're afraid of. Stop letting it be this scary thing that we just can't talk about. And instead, go ahead and name it. Start that conversation with Jesus. You could do that today. If you're not sure where you stand with God, listen, if you're here at church, I'm, I'm glad you're here. But coming to church won't get you to heaven. Coming to church doesn't make you a Christian. You can sit in your garage all day and that won't make you a car. If you're here today and you're not sure where you stand with God, that's step one of this is to be sure of where you're at with the Lord. We would love to take a Bible and help you know for sure all your sins have been paid for, that heaven's your home, that Jesus is your Savior. Would you stay for lunch? Would you let us take a Bible and show you how you can know that for sure? What's God, what do you need to talk to God about? And maybe it's God's just asking you to do something. That's what God's talking to me about. How am I going to grow my relationship with Jesus so that I'm not just checking boxes while the fear gets bigger and bigger? What are the things that I'm doing so that my relationship grows with him so that I can know him better and trust him more? Maybe there's something else God's talking to you about. Whatever it is, you take this moment of quietness right now and do a little business with Jesus. Jesus.